It's a pleasure to welcome to the program New Yorker staff writer Andrew Morantz on his book Antisocial, Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation. Andrew, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, I got to say, now this is uh, sort of exciting for me because we are almost a year to the day, uh, maybe it's a year to two days, when uh, Mike Cernovich got me fired from or <clears throat> started the ball rolling on getting me fired from MSNBC. Um, he ultimately failed or he succeeded and then uh, uh, got rehired. But uh, so it's fun for me to uh, talk to you at this time and, and remember that holiday in my own personal uh, <laughs> life. But um, yeah. <clears throat> um, all right. So so first off, you start at the uh, the, the deplora ball um, and you the thing that excites me about at least, you know, a part of what you've done here is it. Um, acknowledges something that I think um, uh, uh, justifies part of what we do here, which is, you know, cover a lot of these same folks. Um, give me a sense of why you decided to sort of immerse yourself in that world. I mean, you obviously you did so as a reporter and now as an author, but 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 why? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, I was conflicted about it ethically and uh you know you you, you never want to give bad people more attention than they deserve um so i didn't want to you know just give people attention just for the sake of it i wanted to you know use it as a test case for what the internet could do to us as a society um so yeah i didn't want to just go to the deepest, darkest ranges of the internet and just say, what kind of specimens do we have here? And, you know, just hold them up to the light just for the sake of it. I wanted to show, okay, if the internet is built the way it's built, what is that doing to us as a society? And I, because of, you know, the style, the style of reporting I like to do, I wanted to be around people for a long time and see them as examples of how bad our information ecosystem had become. And they were willing to show me. And so, I mean, to be clear, so you're saying that um, the idea was I, I want to see what the uh, I want to spend some time with the input so that I can um, see what the machine looks like. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and I. Uh, uh, sorry, am I cutting in and out on your end? The, the sound? No, you sound good to no? us. All right, cool. All right. Excellent. So um, basically, yeah, I wanted to um, I wanted to see. From both angles. I mean, so the subtitle is Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation, right? So I wanted to see from the tech platform point of view and from the disrupt, you know, I mean, it's funny because they both call themselves disruptors, right? But I wanted to see from the tech platform's point of view and also from the people, you know, the bigots and trolls and propagandists and whoever who were using the platforms so successfully. You know, there was this kind of for the first few years of social media, there was this kind of legend, this kind of halo effect that, you know, all that will come from social media is nice things, you know, Arab Spring and democratic revolutions and, you know, social justice and all the rest of it. And this worked to the benefit of these huge megalith corporations that could just sort of say, well, you know, don't worry about anything we do. We're just going to sort of let it all hang out and it'll all ultimately redound to the good and the arc of history will just naturally bend toward justice. And I think around 2014, 2015, you know, a few of us could really see that that wasn't quite how things were panning out exclusively. I mean, it was in part, but certainly not exclusively. And so I wanted to kind of see it from both sides, from the you know, by embedding in a lot of the companies. I spent a lot of time at the offices of Reddit and some time at the other big companies. But I also wanted to see it from the people like, you know, the deplorables themselves who were very consciously, concertedly setting out to unravel the fabric of our democracy in many ways. I mean, that isn't quite how they would put it, but that's in effect what they were doing. And so, you know, I just sort of said, hey, I'm a journalist. I want to be a fly on the wall and watch you do this stuff. And, you know, some people said no. I mean, Alex Jones said yes and then got cold feet. I mean, there are a lot of examples of people who changed their minds or thought better of it. But most of the people said, yeah, come on in. Um, and I was kind of surprised by that. But I also thought, you know, they're not breaking the rules of these platforms. They're not 
like Russian state actors. They're not breaking any laws. They're not using any illegal campaign funds to to a large extent. I mean, they do sometimes break laws, which we can get into. But for the most part, they're just doing exactly what the platforms are incentivizing them to do, and they're doing it extremely well. So I, you know, spent three or four years documenting what they were doing. And um, to to your question earlier. Sometimes I felt a little transactional about it. Like I worried that they were using me to get more attention or more kind of legitimacy. And that was a constant ethical tug of war that I was working out with myself. But I felt that it was just important to document what they were doing, because if we don't know what they're doing, they can just keep doing it and nobody's even tracking it. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, having uh, started my career and uh, at least in the context of, of this type of work in am talk radio the the uh, the idea of how much a light we were shining on rush limbaugh are we letting him you know uh, blossom or uh, is it is it is it hurting him i think ultimately um it is uh, it's the only way to deal with this problem and then one of the advantages i think i have is that um i have not the credibility to give a platform to someone like this in the same <laughs> way that frankly the the new yorker is so it's less of a um uh, a, a, a dilemma, I think, in my mind. Although I think that the, the, it, it's a tough, it's a tough nut to sort of crack. I think it also has to do with your approach on on how you report on them, right? Like, yeah. you know, in what context? I mean, I mean, frankly, there's a big difference in my mind um, between Barry Weiss sort of allowing to uh, the narrative to be taken over by the IDW, let's say. Like as if there's an actually an intellectual dark web uh, versus sort of saying like, this is what this guy is doing and people can see the problems at on it. Yes. I, look, I think the manner in which you report on stuff is hugely important. And I think the tone of it, the context, how you frame it, these are these are all choices. I mean, people often make out to be a binary thing, you know. Do you do you you know shine a light on dark things or do you not? And I just don't think the binary gets you very far. I mean, you know, just just to take the most extreme example, you know, a lot of reporters have to report on ISIS and they don't um, sort of take it take it as a binary choice to say, well, should we report on ISIS or should we not report on ISIS? I think everybody would see that as a false choice. You know, you you do it carefully. You try to do it without replicating ISIS propaganda in any kind of nefarious way. You try to, you know, keep um, hostages names out of your reporting for their own safety. You know, you just take a various uh, an array of ethical considerations in mind. And I think with with this stuff, with the alt right, with online bigotry, with trolling and all these things, it's a little more complicated, right? It's it's literally closer to home. It's a little more confusing. These people, as opposed to someone like a like an ISIS, who's, you know, really championing how uh, how evil they are in a kind of like novel and shocking way, a lot of times what people in movements like, you know, a lot of neo-fascist movements will do is try to cloak themselves as normal or as the guy next door or, you know, just messing around and just in it for the lulls or whatever. And that, I think, puts an even higher onus on reporters to go in with a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity and not get tricked and not let their readers get tricked. Um, and there's a whole array of ways that that works. And I had to, you know, I had to study up because I, I really was worried about being used or, or getting it wrong. And um, there are a bunch of things I did to get up to speed. But one thing, you know, you were talking about the, the, the difference in what kind of platform you're giving someone. I think there's even a difference, you know, among quote unquote sort of mainstream legitimizing media where, you know, the New Yorker and the New York Times are different places. The New York Times has has a specific kind of paper of record kind of voice. The New Yorker has its own voice, but it's not um, you don't have to be as kind of studiously neutral in the same way. You can sort of say more of what you mean. Now, you're not going to come out like, you know, Gawker and just call someone, you know, some some you know, aspersion or some name in a way that doesn't feel grounded by the context. But if somebody does something stupid or racist, you can say in the text, 
I thought this was stupid or racist. And I, and I did take the liberty of doing that. So I don't, you know, I, I didn't feel that I was in this trap with this book where I said, well, you know, I have to give equal voice to all sides and I have to just, you know, report the facts and there's nothing else I can do. And I think a lot of, a lot of the people, you know, whether you're talking about, um, I mean, anyone in the book, you know, Gavin McInnes or, you know, James O'Keefe or any of the people, Mike Cernovich, uh, and even down to the more just overt kind of anti-Semite Nazi people, they sort of, I don't know what they were thinking exactly, but I think they were partly just, you know, used to my presence because I was around so much. But I think they were also kind of thinking, well, look, you know, this guy doesn't make stuff up. He reports the facts. And as long as he doesn't quote us incorrectly, we'll probably be fine. And I don't know, maybe they weren't quite <laughs> reckoning with the fact that I could also sort of layer my arguments and opinions in there and, you know, that I wasn't just hampered by some kind of old fashioned notion that all I was allowed to do was quote their words and not offer my own analysis. Well, I mean, and, and uh, maybe you're getting a little bit ahead of myself, but but I want to anyways. How and when you want to like because you 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 sat down and we should say like these these people and I think um you acknowledge this are sort of the um, at least the the intellectual uh, uh, disciples of Andrew Breitbart, or at least they're within that tradition where Breitbart's whole thing was uh, politics are downstream from culture. Right. Um, and, um, you know, uh, he he was also a guy who had, as far as I could tell, no ideology. Uh, or at least no uh, ideas that were about conservative policies beyond the fact that um, I think the cool kids wouldn't let him hang out with him uh, in, mm -hmm. in in L.A. And uh, he felt like he was shut out of the cool kids, you know, what he perceived liberal Hollywood elite. And that became sort of the bedrock of everything he did. Um these th this crew in some way uh, are disciples of him and others too, like Ben Shapiro, who doesn't get so much uh, attention from you. But um, but just speak to that for a moment, and then I want to ask you about whether um, whether these people were are, are that. Uh, how much of it is that they are just so celebrity hungry that? They're convinced that any press is good press and they're not that concerned with you being there if you're not, you know, if you're if you don't have an overt agenda. Right. Well, so, well, you know, just to take Ben Shapiro, he he was in part of that early Breitbart crew. Um, yep. And so, yeah, there you know, part of it is I had to be selective. Um, there are so many people that I could have gone right. down various paths with. And, you know, with with people like. Shapiro, there are a few other people like this in the book, you know, I really because these people were my goal was to illustrate how social media is specifically an accelerant of this stuff. I mean, the book is called Antisocial for a variety of reasons, but one is that, you know, it's really a book about what social media can do to us to kind of um, damage our social fabric in addition to the pro-social things that it can do that everybody is more comfortable talking about. So. When I encountered someone, and I think Ben Shapiro kind of falls into this category where, you know, they would have been doing their thing even if social media had never come along. You know, he just would have been doing talk radio right. or, you know, and, and his message would have been the same. You know, he would have been going along, you know, with, with certain tenets of, you know, I love guns and I love religious freedom and whatever. And, you know, maybe the message would have been a little bit different because there wouldn't have been the same kind of incentives that social media algorithms are constantly giving us to spark as much emotion and rage and fear as possible. You know, maybe he wouldn't be, you know, shilling for gold in the same way, or maybe he wouldn't be, you know, he would um, be, but yes, I, I know, but, <laughs> but I, I no, your point's well taken. I think the idea is like, you're looking at animals who are, uh, specifically cr animals. You're looking at cr specifically people who are creatures of social media in some way. And right, where exactly. social media is a but for in terms of their existence. All right. So let's talk about Mike Cernovich. Um, you were sitting with him, uh, if not, I, I think literally, when he um, developed the uh, the narrative that Hillary Clinton had Parkinson's or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just walk yeah, these, us, these, walk us yeah. through that. Well, so these narratives, I mean, who knows where they are born in the in the great you know morass of the internet, sort of collecting conscious. But um, 
I was so I was sitting with him, you know, again, because these things are, are meant to be illustrative examples. I, I go into my uh, my sort of alighting at Cernovich's house in a chapter of the book that I call Reductio ad absurdum. So, you know, I know uh, people love, you know, philosophy lectures, but I, I won't I won't go too deep into it. But basically, a Reductio ad absurdum is an example of something where um, you know, if the premises had been true from the beginning, you would not have arrived at an absurd outcome, right? So there must be something wrong with the premises. So in this case, the premises that Zuckerberg and Dorsey and all the rest of us were giving were, were the free speech wing of the free speech party, we're going to open everything up to everyone, and that will ultimately bring us all closer together and make the world more open and connected and, and change the world for the better. Those were their initial starting premises, and it just so happened that in the process they would accrue unparalleled power and wealth and all the rest of it. I wanted to show that those premises were wrong, and I didn't just want to, you know, go on a screed about it or have an opinion about it because, you know, everybody has opinions about the internet. I wanted to show, okay, who is someone who would not and I think should not <laughs> have the kind of influence they do if not for the flawed and warped premises that we had been fed by the techno-utopian social media founders. And the perfect person I found to illustrate that, I think, was Mike Cernovich. So I went to his house in Orange County and just said, walk me through how you have as much influence as you have. And now... You and know, let me just, just I'm sorry, just, yeah. you know, and temporarily in terms of his career, because he went from a guy who was a men's rights act... Uh, uh, a activist. I guess he was also like a pickup artist uh, type pickup of guy. Pickup artist, yes, and a and a kind of freelance lawyer for the Gamergate movement. And I, I and an anti date rape activist. Like he was a an active uh, date rape denialist. Yeah, well, and so I go into a lot of this in the book because I think it's useful to know, you know, where where people come from. He. Um, he had a rape charge, I think, around the time of law school. You know, he's a lawyer. He graduated from law school, but he didn't um, get admitted to the bar for several years because of this rape charge. And he um, had a, a, a first marriage that ended up breaking up essentially because he was having his own kind of private, you know, anti-feminist awakening, awakening kind of red pilling experience. And as that was happening, kind of as he was not really able to find work and he was kind of um, experiencing a lot of cognitive dissonance between um, blogging about how you know men need to be empowered and they can't be enslaved by you know the women and the feminist ideology of our times he was also um, I mean not to put too fine a point on it but his bills were being paid by his wife who was um, a high-powered tech employee so and that, were, that he got he and, and, and then he got like a big chunk of that uh, Facebook um, cash that she had. Um, yeah. So this is one of these things where if I had been writing a novel, I think my editor would have been like, all right, it's a little heavy handed to have, you know, right. Your kind of tech social media antihero be, you know, literally, you know, bankrolled by someone from the Facebook IPO through a divorce. But, you know. It just so happens that it's true, and I got the court records to to prove it. These are not, you know, things that people were hand to me because it's embarrassing. But um, yeah, I mean, this is this is a case study in how tied up in this people can be. How they, it could be, you know, the thing that is paying the bills and the thing that you know you've known. I mean, he claims, I think, credibly to have had dinner at Sheryl Sandberg's house, and you know met, you know, all the all the higher ups at Facebook through his wife. And then to go from that to um, essentially using these platforms to to, you know, spark all kinds of little waves of, you know, lies and conspiracies and nihilism and, and you know, retrograde politics. It's just a fascinating turn of events um, that, again, <laughs> is in itself a demonstration of how flawed the principles of social media always were. So so that all happens. Um, Leading up to 2014-ish is when Gamergate happens. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't tracking him then, but I went back and, and recreated all this stuff. And then when I encountered him was 2016, when it was really the run up to the 2016 election. And as you mentioned, he he really wanted um, Trump to win and Hillary to lose, um, partly you know to to trigger the libs and to you know mess with the snowflakes and whatever, partly um, because he. 
uh, didn't want immigration into the country and he thought Trump would stop immigration. He, I mean, another one of these great ironies is that his second wife is, you know, comes from Iranian descent, even though he is sort of a proud Islamophobe in many ways. So it's just a weird, I mean, people are just really, really weird and full of dark, scary contradictions um, as, as becomes clear throughout my reporting on this stuff. So, um, you know, I, I said to him, hey, whenever I track one of these memes about Hillary is sick or, you know, video footage of Hillary blinking gets interpreted as her having some kind of stroke or, you know, just bizarre, bizarre kind of rumors that, that you know, people kind of hoping in a kind of freelance propaganda way would damage the Clinton campaign. Whenever I traced one of those things back, chances were that, that Cernovich had a hand in spreading it, if not inventing it, sometimes both. And uh, this was pre-Pizzagate, but it was, it was that kind of class of stuff. And so I just wrote to him and said, hey, it seems like, you know, you are really influential at spreading this stuff. Um, and, you know, we, <laughs> influential is a neutral word. It doesn't mean it's good or bad. I mean, in this case, right. it's bad. <laughs> it just means it is having an influence on, you know, this massively, crucially important presidential election. And as you pointed out from the Andrew Breitbart dictum about politics being downstream from culture, you know, we might like to think, oh, people's votes are not going to be swayed by some weird, random piece of internet detritus that they happen to see about how Hillary Clinton secretly has a neurological disorder. But we don't actually know that to be the case. That's just our hope. We just like hope and pray that people's brains won't be swayed by that stuff. But in fact, they often are. So all of which is to say, I sort of said, I want to see how you do this. And he says, yeah, sure. You know, come watch me do it. So I just go to his house, sit there for several days and then, you know, tracked him for a couple of years off and on after that and just watched how he did it. So, I mean, he, he would just sit at his, you know, little kitchen table and open up a, uh, an iPad with a periscope on it. He would start a periscope and get a, you know, about a thousand, two thousand, you know, kind of his hardcore fans into the periscope and they would sort of workshop what the hashtag was going to be. I was going to say hashtag of the day, but they would really, they would do multiple ones per day. And it would be Hillary's coughing or, you know, Hillary's bringing in terrorists or whatever. I mean, there would, whatever the thing was that he thought would create an association, whether it was true or not true, that would make people afraid or fearful or, or feel some kind of disgust, any of these like visceral viral emotions. And they would pick a hashtag that they thought would trend. Then they would all swarm over to Twitter and get it trending. And uh, again, none of this is against the rules, even though some people argue that it should be against the rules of Twitter to have a kind of coordinated campaign like that. And then um, once it's trending on Twitter, as you and your audience well know, then it kind of gives mainstream journalists permission to touch it. And it kind of makes them feel like they have an obligation to cover it because now it's, you know, it's trending. Now it's like a quote unquote objective, you know, thing that people are talking about. And from there, they could just kind of hijack the news cycle and go, OK, now that it's trending, we can get Drudge to talk about it or we can right. get Fox News to talk about it. And then from Fox News, it can go to the other networks or whatever. Then it becomes a thing. And then it was basically like I would open the newspaper the next day and see a story and go, yeah, I'm pretty sure that story would not be in the newspaper if not for what I watched uh, Cernovich and his cronies do yesterday. Now, this uh, this pipeline, not dramatically different from what we saw like in the in the aughts when uh you would have uh right-wing blogs do this and that that would get to drudge and then drudge uh and then you had you know some producer uh in uh, at abc starting their day every morning reading what drudge says and as soon as drudge gives it an imprimatur it becomes at least worthy of reporting um, but let me ask you this, how much, cause there's two, there, I want to, I want to go in the direction of, of, of a little bit of, of sort of, of, of the platforms themselves, mm -hmm. but also about the, the I just want to uh, stay with the MO of, of Cernovich. Like my, in my experience, uh, with him, I think he had uh, Posobiec go through, uh, I think he, and I think he, at one point he had said this to somebody in an interview that he hired uh, Posobiec to go through my uh, Twitter feed, uh, search, use the search term rape, found a um, uh, a 
uh, a tweet that I put out in 2009 slamming uh, Roman Polanski, really actually people who were, who were apologizing for Roman Polanski uh, by suggesting that, um, uh, it, you know, if, if my daughter's ever raped, I hope it's by someone with a great sense of mise-en-scene uh, as a way of, of, uh, of slamming these people. And he got uh, Seb Gorka and Donald Trump Jr. to retweet it. And that was basically it was off to the races at that point. But one of the things I also noticed was that a lot of the people who were retweeting it had no followers <laughs> and mm. were barely following people. And so simultaneous to this, I, uh, a buddy of mine just started doing, I don't know if it was on one of those like uh, uh, bot or not websites. And there was a lot of bots. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder to what extent, A, you, um, you saw use of this, of this uh, technique. And B, how much, when we look at people like Gavin McGinnis, when we look at people like... Um, you know, even Laura Loomer or, um, uh, you know, folks like um, uh, Posobiec or Cernovich or, or Milo Yiannopoulos. How much how much were you aware or digging into funding sources? Because, yeah. I mean, like I more or less do what these people do on the right. I do this on the left. I mean, I don't I, I'm not as deceitful and I, I don't lie. But, you know, if someone called me a propagandist, uh, you know, at least with some of the work, I would say, well, I think that's, you know, in, in a val in a, a value neutral term, that's correct. My growth would be greatly would be much bigger than it is now if I was to receive, let's say, Here's three hundred thousand dollars, Sam. Two years ago, and uh, you're going to buy ads, or you're going to buy bots, or you're going to do this. I wonder because, you know, Breitbart got twelve million dollars invested right around the time before he died. Uh, that Bannon and, and 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 that site was not even remotely profitable at that time. You could just go on and you could just calculate the ads. There was no ads on that site when he got that investment. I'm quite sure it came from the Mercers in retrospect, but. Um, what, how much of that did you see that they were getting funding from anywhere? Yeah, well, and, and, you know, the Mercers were careful to try to cover their tracks on that Breitbart investment really up until the time that the Senate, I believe it was, forced them to disclose it so that Breitbart could get White House press credentials. And that was one of those things where, you know, just a couple of years earlier, Breitbart was not thinking about what happens when we get White House press credentials. I mean, right. it just shows you what a weird timeline we're in. Um, with the others, yeah, I mean, so all the people you mentioned are in the book, um, Loomer, Posobiec, um, there, there are many others. Jeff Giese is a kind of funding source for some of the people, but it's not clear that that's continuing. This is a guy who once worked with Peter Thiel and, and now kind of, uh, he told me that he f has funded some of this stuff in the past. But, you know, because a lot of this stuff is... Um, smaller scale a lot of it works by working in concert um, and kind of being a kind of coordinated effort it's not like there's one big you know pile big of money elephant in right. the room yeah so sometimes it would be you know I mean Milo had a you know a kind of mysterious Bitcoin millionaire who was going to be his benefactor and then that guy died and you know it's a lot of kind of random sources like this now obviously you know I was tracking that stuff um, and I definitely put in, you know, things that I saw that were suggestive. I mean, I definitely, um, and some of it, you know, some of it made it into the book, some of it didn't. I mean, there was, you know, Cassandra Fairbanks, for example, would often sort of say that she was, you know, in constant touch with Julian Assange and she was going to visit him at the embassy where he was living and DMing with him. And, you know, she seemed on the one hand a little bit fearful about disclosing that, but on the other hand, you know, not that careful about it. So, you know, if Julian Assange is getting, you know, bankrolled by the Russians, then it's possible that people like Cassandra are too. And, you know, she has worked for Sputnik at various times. They also, but the thing that's so weird is that on the one hand, some of this stuff would be really shady and possibly criminal if it was exposed. On the other hand, because of this bizarre timeline we're in, you know, we see criminal activity every day from the White House that nobody seems to care about. Right. And if they don't care about it from the president, they're not really going to care about it from a, you know, third string neo-fascist. So it's like they can kind of just do it in broad daylight. I mean, they, 
you know, they, I went to a Halloween party in DC with a bunch of the deplorables and, you know, some of them were dressing up. I mean, they, they're very catty with each other. Some of them were kind of dressing up as each other in kind of, you know, uh, in kind of unkind ways. A lot of them had turned on Laura Loomer at that point, And some of them were, were dressed up in ways that were meant to mock her, which, you know, I'm not generally in the habit of, you know, of shedding a lot of tears for, for, you know, vicious Islamophobes like Laura Loomer, but, you know, I did feel bad for her in that moment. Um, but then... Was this before other... or after she chained herself to uh, the front door of Twitter? It was before she chained herself to the front door of Twitter, but it was after she pretended to get her tires slashed on her car. So right. there were there, there were multiple, and again, this is, I try to, I try to, you know, sprinkle this stuff lightly throughout the book because, as you sort of said earlier, it's kind of you know, in a sense, an, an ethnography of these people, but it's really using them as an example of the larger forces in our society. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of drama and intrigue and rumor and all this stuff, but I tried to go easy on that stuff because really all of these people could disappear from the face of the earth. And, you know, some of them in a sense have, I mean, Milo and Alex Jones, people like that, once they get wiped out by these platforms, their careers are really over. But I, I don't want people to rest easy and, and be complacent in the sense that, oh, we there's know, new ones these... growing every day. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be. Yeah. I when mean, the they, these guys have a, have a short half life, but um, the system that generates them, I think, is is there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. When the structural incentives are there, they're going to keep growing. But, you know, Cassandra dressed up as uh, uh, with a buddy dressed up as Boris and Natasha, you know, and said, haha, you know, the joke is we're Russian spies. And I was like, is that a joke? Or I mean, it, you know, you, you, you never really know. Some of this stuff is kind of tantalizing slash, you know, gaslighting if you take it too seriously. But yeah, I think to your, to your larger point that these, that what matters is the system that these platforms are building. It's, it's, it's less this or that individual. And, you know, should they, should they be banned or should they be sanctioned or should they be quarantined or, you know, should you leave them alone because free speech? Like those are all, you know, debates we can have. But the larger debate is not about the, the you know, 18 individuals who are in this book. The larger debate is about are we going to build a better structure so that we're not constantly in this snarl of informational crisis that we can't get out of? Are we going to actually you know, create a movement to make these companies build better systems so that we don't constantly keep running into these problems. Yeah. Let's talk about those systems, because it seems to me that this is there's there's a couple of things going on that allow for, you know, this type of stuff, fake news. I mean, particularly in the context of YouTube as well, um, that there is a um, that it's that's two part. One, there is a huge financial incentive, right? I mean, it's not like, I mean, I think you start off by saying like they have this premise of free speech and how it's going to democratize everything. And on some, to some extent, I think there is some truth to that, but it's also, we're building, we're building a machine that's going to print money and uh, the fuel for that printing money is going to be a lot of this stuff. And the, the game that I think these outlets are playing seems to be, how can we continue to put fuel into this money-making machine and also make it seem to society that we're trying to curb that problem, which is actually driving a lot of the profits. Yeah. And specifically the fuel of the machine, I think the central thing for people to keep in mind above all else is that these platforms run as they're currently designed around emotional engagement at what, what social scientists call activating emotions. So it's not just, you know, if you have good content or if you, you know, really blow people's minds, it, it's, uh, there's a, a very specific way of doing this that has been studied by scientists and by, you know, um, content producers alike. And it's not like there's anything inherently wrong with getting people excited or wowing them or like, as you said earlier, it's not like there's anything really wrong with opinionated, um, journalism that, that some people could call propaganda. It, that's not the problem. The problem is not that there are people with, you know, really colorful opinions out there. The problem is that these systems are built, it, it's not a level playing field. You know, they, they like to pretend that they're just sort of holding up a mirror to the national discourse, but they are warping the mirror. I mean, it's like, it's like a casino company saying, well, we're just providing a service because people really want to, you know, have fun playing on slot machines. But like, 
that's obviously disingenuous. They've designed a whole system where you know, they don't have windows, so you never know what time it is, and they pump the air full of oxygen, and they give you free drinks, and they do all these things to incentivize you to stay, even if you are a gambling addict who's going to lose your house because, you know, you can't find a way to get out of the casino. And then they turn around and say, well, you know, it's on you, you know, it's your free will that led you into this scenario. So it's not like individual agency has no role to play in this. Obviously, there are some people who are better at, you know, not having social media destroy them and warp their brains. But as a society, what it's doing to us collectively is pretty scary. So, you know, uh, look, I, I, I think all things being equal, it's obviously better not to censor people and not to shut down speech. I mean, I'm a journalist. I really love the First Amendment. I, you know, all that sort of is stipulated, but it doesn't mean that because you love free speech, you don't pay attention to the incentives. And the incentives here are for people to spark the easiest lizard brain emotions they can because those are the things that go viral. And when you have a system that's literally built around giving people more points, if they are more scary or more titillating or more suggestive or more shocking, you're, you're putting a finger on the scale. I mean, is it possible to have these type of like behemoths essentially um, without that? Yeah, totally. They, they would just maybe make a little bit less money. I mean, it's, it's sort of like, you know, is it possible to have, you know, McDonald's, uh, you know, source their potatoes more ethically and, you know, maybe uh, make them, you know, not so terribly bad for you? Uh, it's possible. It just means that they might lose out on the competition to Burger King or whatever, and they just don't have any incentive to do it. Um, well, that's what I mean, though. Is that like, uh, yes. And if I, it, you know, it's possible I could fly if I had wings. I mean, I'm, right. I'm asking if it's that type of scenario. Like well, if a company that has the freedom to do what it's doing, is it possible based upon the structure that we have, you want to call it capitalism or whatever, to actually do these things that are contrary to maximizing profit? Um it's hard, right? I mean, given the way capitalism works, it's hard to move the needle on a big company. Now, I think, you know, the McDonald's analogy is maybe even less pointed than it should be because it's almost like if McDonald's owned, you know, 98% of the market share instead of, you know, 60% or whatever they own. I don't know what the real numbers are, but, you know, it's it's like as if Wendy's and Burger King and all these other competitors right. were really, really, you know, so far down the the chain. Um, look, I mean, you know, McDonald's <laughs> serves more salads and things than they used to. Um, I, I think you can move the needle that way by creating consumer demand and creating movements and, you know, making customers, you know, uh, push for more things that they want. You know, you can also, um, but can it come, for, I, I yeah. guess what I'm saying is, can it come from that direction or does it have to be that there is, it is, we, we need to, either um, make these companies fundamentally different in their structure through antitrust or regulate them like we would, I don't know, uh, you know, a national grid, but more, uh, but even more, I think, uh, um, rigorous in some respects. Yeah, I think that government definitely has a role. Um, it's really tricky, right, because of the First Amendment. So you can't just have the government step in and have some, you know, ministry of truth that, that you know, tells people what is or isn't true. Obviously, nobody wants that. Um, in a way, it's almost more like the food analogy, where you do have an FDA, and it's hugely imperfect, but, you know, you, you are regulating to make sure that McDonald's can't put arsenic in their hamburgers, you know, or that, you know, if they have a salmonella outbreak, you know, you know how to put that, you know, how to contain that and who to punish for it. Um, so there's that basic level of just sort of safety and regulation, which we don't have on the internet. So that would be a good first step. And then there's also a cultural awareness. I mean, like, uh, you know, maybe the, maybe the better analogy here is the tobacco industry. Tobacco industry had no incentive to not, you know, addict everyone they could to cigarettes, including, you know, nine-year-olds getting them hooked on bubblegum flavored, you know, vape pens or whatever. 
But the needle did move with the tobacco industry. Again, it's not perfect and the problem hasn't been solved, but I mean, the, there's been a huge amount of cultural progress in the last 20 years. Some of that has been from government regulation, but some of it has been, as you say, from the ground up, from just the cultural understanding that smoking is gross and it's not cool. Like I, you know, I don't want to be but that you know, naive from, about it. But that came from that came that that came from basically proving that they had had, had engaged in fraudulent practices, right? Like that they uh, that came from a massive settlement funding. Uh, that cultural change came from funding from a massive settlement that was a function of proving that the the tobacco executives knew that they were causing these deaths. And yeah, I don't know that I we think... have that same. I mean, I guess maybe we could get to that point with a Google. I guess what I'm asking is like, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, government regulation, like we could say, and I guess this is your food analogy, you need to stop using algorithms as a way of moderating uh, in these different silos. If you want to use algorithms when it comes to, um, you know, and they do this, right? Like I just saw some TikTok that was pulled down because a woman was... Um, was pretending to do an eyelash video and in between, you know, uh, showing uh, girls how to do thicker eyelashes with an eyelash uh, scissors or whatever that is, uh, she was talking about the Uyghurs in China and uh, and asking people to, to uh, protest against that. And TikTok was able to pull it down. Um, and, you know, I don't. Think right. They and should. that's an example of how. Right. That's an example of how scary things can get. And TikTok is owned by a Chinese company that has no respect for free speech at all. So this is where I think the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world have their best argument. Uh, and they make it a lot these days. You know, you'd, you'd rather have us doing it because if not, China's going to do it and they're going to do it with no respect to human rights. Now, I don't think that means that Mark Zuckerberg can just do whatever he wants. But I, I do think he's right in the sense that, you know, you don't want um, some, you know, dictatorial government with no no accountability making these decisions. I certainly don't want the Trump administration making these decisions. So, you know, it's tricky, right? You don't want to just sort of say, okay, you know, everything that is bad gets shut down on the internet. I mean, I think obviously we can see what a slippery slope that leads to. I think, the, you know, I guess my thing when people bring up the slippery slope that I just brought up of, you know, well, if you censor one thing, aren't you going to censor everything else? I, I sort of, I don't discount that, but I guess I just would like to raise the other slippery slope, which is what if you do let all these people speak? You know, people talk about if you censor Nazis' right to march in public, you know, you're going to censor me next. But like, what about the slippery slope that happens when you do let Nazis speak in public? I think it's worth worrying about both scenarios. But don't, uh, maybe but it's just because I like worrying about everything. But Right, yeah, no, I and I share that uh, yeah. fear. But I mean, right now, let's be honest. I mean, we're on the slippery slope. There's never a time you're not. I mean, the I, I can look at my YouTube numbers right now, and I can see that over the past six to eight months, the number of people who find my videos because they're subscribed to me versus the the uh, how YouTube suggests it to people has dramatically shifted. Hmm. Eight months ago, nine direction? months ago, uh, it was almost 50-50. In fact, hmm. uh, 10 months ago, it was 60% suggested um, 40% uh, subscribers, it has more than flipped. It is now about 70, 30. And that is because uh, YouTube, when people are now looking for a specific topic, they'll go to MSNBC. They will, uh, YouTube will push MSNBC or CNN. I mean, any YouTube user, you know, ha has noticed this, that the, the corporate um, um, uh, news medias are, are pushed forward, uh, uh, you know, uh, prior to, to us. And so, the, Google's already making that decision. They're ju they're just doing it on a different type of of I guess uh, plane, right? Like they're just doing it on uh, by, based upon like what corporate sources are more reliable than independent sources in some way. Or and you know we're talking about you know it's not like there's a huge amount of reporting that we're talking about in these instances. A lot of it's commentary, and um, and so. The, the Google's already doing it, it seems to me. It's just a question of just like forcing them to use people because a lot of it, it seems to me, and you would have a better sense of this having been in these offices, is that they don't want to spend the money or even set yeah. the precedent that they would have humans do this stuff who can make assessments that are a little bit more rational than machines. 
Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, it's, you know, the, the sort of the tech mindset is, you know, humans aren't scalable, you know, they're annoying, you have to pay them, you have to give them bathroom breaks. It's like, it's much easier to just have, you know, machine learning or artificial intelligence do it. And yeah, as you are pointing out, there are huge limitations to what artificial intelligence can do. I mean, obviously people aren't perfect either. There's no perfect solution to any of this, but humans have to be involved at some level. And that is a an inefficiency or a friction point, you know, to use the tech terminology for it, which, um, you know, again, like this is where, this is where I do think that sort of basic expectations matter of these companies. Part of it is a structural thing just at, in the sense of how big they are. Like this is where I think there's a lot to be said for the kind of, you know, Elizabeth Warren slash Louis Brandeis way of thinking about the curse of bigness. Like, you know, Google making its own unilateral decisions, as you say, it's sort of just the company doing it on its own. But one thing that makes that, um, if not unique, then really unusual, is that they are just such a quasi monopolistic power that it's almost like, you know, and this is a case with Amazon too. And in many cases, it's, it's the case with Facebook too, that, you know, by biasing they own so much of the infrastructure that by biasing the infrastructure, they're 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 really warping things more than any other company would be able to. So it's 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 not only like McDonald's changing its menu. It's like McDonald's owning the roads and being able to suggest which exit you get off and then putting a McDonald's right at that exit. I mean, it's it's like a a, a, a much huger chunk of the infrastructure that they're able to control. So I think in that sense, there's a good argument for breaking some of these companies up. Um, but I also don't think that antitrust action, even if it could be taken, would get you all the way there. I mean, Facebook has already been fined five billion dollars by the FTC last year. It was the biggest fine in uh, FTC history, and immediately the analysis was like, "Oh, not a big deal. Facebook will will pay that without blinking." Right. And so, yeah, I think there's I think there's government action that that could be huge and unprecedented, and could be still not enough. And this is where, you know, it people sort of think of it as kind of, you know, soft headed or naive or, or whatever to talk about cultural change. And I, I see I see that. But I also think that cultural change is a huge part of this. I mean, it's a feedback mechanism, right? You have governmental change because you have cultural change and, and vice versa. And so I think part of it is, you know, when I was sitting in the offices of some of these companies, sometimes they would make decisions because if we don't do this, we're going to get sanctioned by the government. But often it would be we're going to get hit really hard in the press. We're going to have users defect or we're just going to feel like lepers and pariahs when we go walk around San Francisco. I mean, you know, don't forget, like these people care a lot about their legacies. These 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 tech bros, they you know, I call them sort of riffing on um, the Michael Lewis term for bankers. I call them big swinging brains in the book. I mean, they really want to be seen as the brainiest, most luminary, most forward thinking People. They want their names on buildings. They want to they want to have great legacies like, you know, Bill Gates, the philanthropist. And so that's not the only leverage point. But I really think we underestimate what a leverage point that is, the kind of appealing to their ego and their their desire to be seen as as vectors for positive social change. And if everyone in the world thinks that you are on the wrong side of history, that's that's a powerful motivating force to, to do something Better. I'm not naive enough to think that that's all you need, but I, I think we we discount it too much sometimes. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I prefer to see them uh, all just split up into very small pieces, but uh, <laughs> and then uh, and then and I think it'll be easier at that point uh, for any cultural uh, changes to happen. the The book is anti-social, online extremists, techno utopians, and the hijacking of the American conversation. Andrew Morantz, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Thank you. All right, folks, I'm going to take a quick break, head to the uh, fun half of the program. Um, I, I, uh, uh, folks should read the book. I could have talked to them for a long time. Apparently, a lot of those folks who were uh, a lot of like the, um, the neo-fascists, um, and I, I think he has, he has categories of people uh, in the book that... Um, that run from, uh, let's see, alt-right to alt-light to full-on um, Nazis. And, um, and he says a lot of these people actually came from 
which is not to say I don't want anybody to over uh, interpret this. Uh, but that's uh, a lot of these people uh, come from the um, uh, the libertarian anti-war movement, and they became a little bit uh, uh, disenchanted with Trump for this. A lot of those people have gone to Tulsi. Now, you, you know, but, damn. Um, that's I, I I I don't know that that means anything other than that that it's a description of where these people are at. But 